Good evening, and once again, welcome to another edition of the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And tonight, it's part two of this last week, since it's now Wednesday, and it's now a new comic book week, but last week's new comics, bitches! <laughs> and uh, as we covered the... Uh, as we covered the independence last night, it is tonight that we'll be covering the the big two, Marvel and DC. Some new number ones and some finales and some really good and some. Not so good stuff. So, but some interesting news uh, today. Now, of course, uh, there was, we had the announcement uh, today, uh, for those of you who were reading it, uh, if you went to Newsarama or Bleeding Cool or uh, Comic Book Resources, uh, of course, we found out that we have, uh, that now that, uh, Jeff Johns has left Green Lantern, uh, that we have uh, a new slew of writers to swoop in and take over uh, the various Green Lantern books. Uh, uh, for example, Green Lantern will now be written by Robert Vendetti and Billy Tan, or will be drawn by Billy Tan. Uh, and... There's going to be a Larflees uh, book, whatever. Um, no, uh, like, Sapphire book, which I think would actually be really cool. I think that book would be really interesting. Uh, but most importantly, at least to me, obviously, is that we have not one, but two titles of the Lantern Saga that are going to be written by Joshua Hale Fialkoff. One of them is going to be the Green Lantern Corps, uh, which will also be illustrated by Bernard Chang, who's been doing an awesome job on Demon Knights, and uh, he will also be writing Red Lanterns with uh, Alessandro Vitti. Uh, I think it is. Uh, he's done some art for uh, the uh, Cullen Bunn, uh, uh, Captain America and Hawkeye, uh, little series that he did there. Um, I'm pissed that they're giving Fialkov uh, a book that is kind of already on the chopping block. But he does have his uh, Dynamite series called The Devilers uh, coming out uh, in a while. And he's got uh, just today that came out uh, the five-issue uh, limited series of Alpha Big Time, which I do have to say I read the first issue and you'll be hearing about it next week. But I will tease you and say that it's pretty fucking awesome. Um, and, but... This means I have to start kind of giving a shit about Green Lantern books again. <laughs> and I'm kind of mad about that. But, you know, whatever. Because I'll get, you know, if Joshua, you know, if, if Fialkov's name is on it, I'll get it. That's just the way that, you know, it's just what comes, that's what it comes down to. Um, because I, I just can't leave. I was hoping that it would be that Fialkov would get, like, a new book or something like that, but for all I know, I mean, because, you know, obviously, at least with uh, Green Lantern Corps, he does have, there's some longevity <laughs> to that book already built in. Red Lanterns, again, not so much, but anyway. Let's talk about the actual comics that came out this week. I'm just, I'm, I'm excited about that, so, uh, so, yay, Josh. Uh... So let's talk about, first, let's kick it off with Marvel and one of the new Marvel Now number ones, which is Uncanny X-Men number one. This is Brian Michael Bendis and Chris Pachalo. Now basically what we have opens up with uh, Stranger 
we don't know who it is, uh, has come to Maria Hill, has come to one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s kind of, I don't know, black sites, if you will, um, to talk with Maria Hill about what's going on with this new X-Men, uh, with that Scott Summers is leading, because we have, of course, we have Scott, we have Emma, we have Ileana, uh, we have... Um, some other people, uh, you know, like a healer and uh, the, the girl that can stop time um, and somebody else, I forgot already. Anyway, um, so that, you know, just that this is that his group, this group of X-Men is basically, they are kind of the revolutionary X-Men, of course, and of course Magneto. Um, it's kind of like the revolutionary, they're like mutant revolutionaries now. And this is because they are just not going to stand for mutants being treated like second class citizens now that there are uh, all of these new mutants sprouting up all over the world. Um, so Scott has taken it upon himself to fit himself with this new helmet, uh, which is you know, his, like, optic beams, now it's, like, in the shape of an X. Uh, and he is now the face of the mutant revolution. And so we have this scene in which we do find another new mutant uh, who has popped up. And this new mutant has uh, the ability to create balls. Uh Almost, it kind of just reminded me of Speedball. It's just this big fat dude who can create, create all these balls and they seem to be kind of hurting people, though he doesn't mean to, of course. And then, of course, the cops start, you know, basically come out, coming off like jackbooted fascists, start tasing him and beating the crap out of him. And here, of course, is when, you know, basically making, you know, a, you know, a very pointed case that the law when it comes to mutants is completely arbitrary. It is almost like a, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of a shoot first, ask questions later kind of mentality that is in this universe, despite the fact that, I mean, and this is mostly, I guess, due to the fact that, you know, we've had this big uh, Avengers versus X-Men event um, and you know how people are seeing mutants, even though there seems to be actually overwhelming uh, support for the mutant movement, and that Scott Summers is now kind of the poster boy for that movement, um, and is gaining more and more traction. And so here comes Scott and his guys to save the day, but things are just a little bit off. Well, not a little bit, just they're a lot off. Magneto, he's got kind of this new, this new all white costume. Um, I don't know what uh, they're trying to say with that, but whatever. Um, that you know, his his powers are off again, as as we knew. Um, Emma's powers still seem to be off, uh, and of course, then we have Scott, who is trying to you know defend this young new mutant, kind of blows up half this mall that they're in. Fortunately, nobody is killed, but, you know, a lot of people are injured, and, you know, it destroys the fucking mall, because his optic blasts are off. Um, because the whole idea is, you know, with Ileana's powers, they can port in and port out when they find a new mutant, especially, you know, and they always, they, they always seem, and with the, the time-stopping girl, you know, she can, you know, stop everything inside the dome uh, that she creates, and basically they can just kind of leave with this new mutant. Uh, but, of course, you know, they're always under attack, these, these new mutants that they're finding. Um, they're always being treated unjustly. And so we're back to that now. Um, so basically, you know, we come, we get this more kind of sort of talking head thing with with Maria Hill and this 
person that she's talking to, this man, and saying how you know you cannot you know that Scott Summers deserves to pay. He des you know he is a, he's a murderer, and he's a criminal, and he deserves to pay for what he's doing. But you can't kill him because to kill him would be to make a martyr out of him, which would just further the cause. Which of course makes sense given the public support of 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 Cyclops. Uh, and then of course I'm going to kind of spoil it for you. So if you're you know, if you're not into it, you might want to just stop when I uh, start giving a new book. So I'll do my standard mm, hand thing when I'm done. So here's here goes the hand. Hand is coming up. It's spoiler alert time. So hand up. Mute your, you know, mute now. Okay, so the stranger is Magneto. And he's basically saying that even though he and Charles didn't always see eye to eye, he still wants justice for Charles' death, and he will work with S.H.I.E.L.D. to help bring Scott Summers down. And spoiler. Okay, so... The thing about this book that really bothered me, two things that really bothered me, is that... I know how much Bendis is in love with kind of the talking head thing um, and, you know, making a very, uh, very talky book. Um, and I know that kind of the natural evolution of where this, uh, of where Scott's going makes sense. But, you know, I, for one thing, I would like, it, it seems really hacky, I guess, is the best way that I can say it. This seems like a really hacky book for Bendis to be writing because it's just like, it's more, you know, mutants, you know, all the mutants that are popping up now, they're just being abused and just hurt and, you know, it's terrible for them, you know, when they, you know, when they get their new powers and everything like that, or when this X gene is woken up. And, you know, obviously Scott sees a reflection of what he's gone through and the other mutants, because most of them are older, or seeing what they've gone through, you know, with their awakening of their mutant powers and how they're looked at as freaks and everything like that. But, I mean, with all of them popping up all over the globe, you'd, see, you'd almost see these things as maybe almost kind of an everyday occurrence with the, the rate that uh, they're talking about how they're springing up. So that to me just didn't sit right. This whole kind of you know almost Rodney Kingish beating of you know uh, this treatment of this mutant, um, and then you know all of their powers kind of being all haywire and shit like that. It just, uh, it's just it's there. There's nobody likable in this book, and it's not like a a book like Uncanny X Force where they're doing bad things for the right reasons. But it's just, you know, I can't get behind Scott Summers. I can't get behind Magneto. I can't get behind Emma Frost. I can't get behind Ileana. Because they all seem to believe that they're taking the moral high ground. But, you know, what it... In reality, it seems to be that they're just almost kind of kidnapping. And I know this phrase gets thrown a lot, especially now in our current political atmosphere. The indoctrination of these young mutants. And this is just a shame because, you know, Bendis has been doing such a great job on all new X-Men. I was hoping that some of that same feeling would be brought over to this uh, this title, and it's not. Another big part of it is that Chris Pachalo's art is not really good at all in this book. It feels, it looks very rushed. Uh, like he was under some kind of insane deadline to get this finished, even though he's kind of been off, uh, you know, Wolverine and the X-Men for a while. So, you know, he's this book just looks bad. It just doesn't look good at all. And, you know, it's like... It, it seems like Bendis has an idea of a story that he wants to tell, but he doesn't have a, a specific story that he does want to tell. So... That's just where I'm coming from from this book. I just really didn't like it. This is at best a two out of five. I will not be collecting this book. It's a shame. Uh, another big number one uh, this week uh, is Secret Avengers. Uh, so here we have Nick Spencer and artist Luke Ross 
uh, kind of uh, getting a new mission statement for this this new uh, Secret Avengers because we have uh, really right now we just have uh, Hawkeye and Black Widow and people like Daisy Johnson and uh, Marcus Johnson, aka Nick Fury, uh, the you know our you know kind of Ultimate Universe, our Black Nick Fury, if you will, and uh, Phil Coulson, who uh, Luke Ross has really decided to make full on Clark Gregg uh, in this issue. Um, and basically what they're looking to do is they're looking to enlist Clint and Natasha in kind of these covert ops for S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, and taking down, of course, very powerful people that are kind of, you know, obviously skating along the lines of the law and just kind of stepping over. So it's not quite, you know, the kind of big bad secret ops that Brubaker was doing or the crazy world domination uh, stuff that... Uh, that Rick Remender was doing. Uh, again, they're just kind of changing the rules again with this book. And um, they are told about the mission that they're going to be doing. And of course, you know, Clint and Natasha, they're not too sold on this idea because it does come with certain conditions. And one of those conditions is that you can have no knowledge afterwards of the mission that you've performed. Basically, mind control. Uh, and Natasha, of course, not a big fan of that idea at all. Uh, and so they kind of start to balk at it, but then Coulson, in his pitch, said, tells them something about redacted. And then, next panel, we're in. Just tell us what to do. And but we're not too crazy about, you know, still about this idea, this whole mind control. And, uh, but uh, Coulson then reveals that actually you already have signed on for this, uh, whether you knew it or not. Because when I shook your hands, this ring that's on my finger has actually admitted uh, all these nanomites into your, into your system. And, you know, even though you're all wearing gloves, it will eventually work its way in and it will start doing what it needs to do. Uh, inside your brain. Of course, this kind of pisses them off, but they're like, hey, you know, Coulson's like, hey, you know, you both have, you know, you, you may be, you know, good people now, but, you know, you have had criminal pasts. So even if they're, you know, iffy criminal pasts, um, particularly, at least particularly for Clint. Um, but basically they find, you know, they're, so they're already under Shield's thumb, and then we have this expository sequence with Daisy Johnson, uh, who is the acting director of Shield, and basically saying, you know, if you're in any way kind of like the whole IMF, uh, you know, thing, you know, if you, you know, if you, you know, if the mission is compromised, we activate the, you know, kind of the memory wipe, um, and. You know, or if you go off book on this mission, we activate the memory wipe. And so, you know, they get around to all the bad things that could potentially happen, and then, you know, Clint says, okay, well, what's with the good things? And basically they're after, uh, you know, a guy who's involved in, you know, drug smuggling, murder, human smuggling, and he's also a practitioner of the dark arts. Uh, you know, could be the next, almost as powerful as maybe the next... Uh, uh, Sorcerer Supreme. So, and this all takes place, of course, in Budapest. So, even in this, we have this little throwback to the Avengers film, in which you know you have that scene where it's like, you know, where Tasha and Clint are there and they're shooting, you know, the arrows and the guns, like you know, just like Budapest, huh? And you know, of course, you know, Clint says, you know, you and I remember Budapest very, very differently, and basically. The book itself is about covert ops, about the way that these people like Nick Fury uh, and Coulson and Johnson and Clint and Natasha go about their jobs uh, because they get in a whole mess of trouble. Uh, Haw you know, Hawkeye's been shot. That's actually how the book opens, and he's being interrogated, but he cannot say 
how he, you know, what exactly he's doing there. Literally, he cannot tell them because he has no idea. So we have this notion that, yes, this button has already been pushed. Um, you know, and of course, it's Natasha that kind of saves the day, but there's a lot of duplicity going on here, particularly on the part of our kind of new Nick Fury uh, and Johnson. And, uh, you know, there's this whole thing with kind of like these health, these self-healing bullets um, and, you know, just the way that they have to do things in order to get the job done. And what it all boils down to is the, the reason that they're really after this guy is because he has the ability to teleport. And they found out about a high-value target that is on the list for assassination. Um, and if they can teleport, you know, because they're actually going to, he's actually trying to sell some of this abilities to, uh, to terrorist organizations around the world. And, you know, if one of the bad guys, you know, Al-Qaeda, whatever, get their hands on it, you know, it could be really bad. And, of course, it does. We do get an example of that right before this guy is taken down where somebody is teleported into the Oval Office. But gets a very leaden surprise when he arrives. So, it, again, it shows the stakes that this world has, but not in so much... I mean, partially in kind of a super villain sense, but also in a very kind of real world sense, at least as far as the threats that they're facing. And it shows the lengths of which S.H.I.E.L.D. is willing to go to make sure that the people that work for them are ultimately cooperative, even if they don't know it. So this, to me... I just I, I really liked the, the this take of you know just having all this kind of sneaky spy shit going on. Uh, it, it gives uh, it gives this issue uh, some more meat and it gives it a little bit more to work with from kind of a new number one standpoint. Uh, you know, so it's you know it's it's not that big on action, uh, but it, it is big on concept, and that's one of the things that I do like about this. Is that it feels new. It feels like this is ground we haven't actually really tread upon before, at least not recently. Um, but Ross's art, you know, is really good here. He does some really nice stuff, and of course, you know, Spencer's throwing around a lot of really interesting ideas here, and of course, he's got some really cool dialogue, particularly with the introduction of Nick Fury and uh, and a concept that I actually, an idea that I had for a really long time about how the actors who play James Bond, you know, keep getting, you know, are, are uh, you know, they're obviously different people, but they have the same name. Well, how do you solve that problem? I always actually, you know, my pet theory was that, you know, Bond is actually, he's just, you know, the 007, uh, you know, the 007 rating, whoever Agent 007 is, is just going to be named James Bond. James Bond himself isn't actually going to have the the past that he has. But that was, again, just a pet theory. But it was, it's kind of, it was one of the things that I was like, I really connect with that because I've actually thought that in my own head. Um, so this was just, I thought this was a really smart book. I think it could have been a little bit longer, could have been a little bit... Uh, because it was kind of one and done for this issue, and that's that, and that's fine. But I think that this concept might have gotten a little bit more legs to start out with, uh, because we do get some stakes, but they don't feel particularly high when you know Hawkeye's in danger, uh, you know, even when he's riddled with bullets, uh, because obviously we know Hawkeye's not going to die, you know. So again. But it was a four out of five. Like I said, it's uh, pretty, you know, it's a solid four out of five. You know, Spencer again doing some really good work for the books that came out last week. So just you know, four out of five for Secret Avengers number one. Wolverine and the X Men number twenty five. Uh, now basically we've got uh, Logan. He takes a bunch of the students, like ID and the unfortunately now feral Brew, uh, and the Eye Boy and uh, Glob Johnson and or whatever his name is. Uh, I think it's Glob Johnson um, and Kid Genesis 
uh, and Sprite, and uh, of course Quentin Quire, on a bit of a field trip to the Savage Land. And of course, what starts out as, you know, it seems to be, well, not too much of a big thing. Just he's taking them to the Savage Land, and basically it's going to be a trust building exercise. Is that uh, Logan is going to run through the Savage Land and they have to find him. But in order to find him, they have to work together as a team. So he's literally throwing them into the deep end because they're in the Savage Land. And what does the Savage Land have a lot of? It has a lot of dinosaurs. <laughs> Um, and we've got, you know, so he sticks one of the T-Rexes in the leg and he's like, here we go. We're starting now. And then we get some of these flashbacks to, uh, prior, you know, to earlier on in the, uh, uh, in the, in this story, uh, where we have, uh, you know, Logan kind of explaining what he's going to be trying to do. And, you know, we have this, this great scene on the plane where, uh, um, uh, Quentin Quire is being, again, kind of harassed by Logan, but, you know, he wants to, because he, he realizes that Quire is, he's a pretty smart guy, and so he, you know, despite all of his severe, you know, issues with authority, and particularly with the X-Men being an authority, but, you know, and Quentin always, you know, he keeps talking about, you know, talking smack about these guys. And it's like, you know, you know, if I, I, just, I, you know, the only reason I'm sticking around is because I can, you know, I can't wait, you know, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just waiting to see this film, this school go up in ashes. And of course, that's not really the thing because like Logan says to him, look, you know, when Rachel's, when the whole clown thing came in with uh, Frankenstein Circus, uh, you know, Rachel's, you know, telepathic ties to you were severed, so you could have split at that point in time. So, you know, I think you're here because you want to be here, not because you just want to watch the place burn down. And, of course, then Logan cast the final vote on that uh, was began under Charles Xavier while he was still alive, for Quentin Quire to become class president. And of course, this is the final vote that elects Quentin Quire class president. Um, so we have this moment of uh, once they're in the uh, once they're in the Savage Land and you know and Wolverine has taken off, we have some great fun with the dinosaurs and with, you know, everybody kind of killing the dinosaurs and, you know, punching them up. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, Kid Genesis, you know, you know, of course, you know, you know, people keep saying, you know, like, why are you saying, you know, why don't you just grow up and be the, you know, the villain that we all know that you're going to eventually be someday so that, you know, we can use your power and get out of this. Um, and, you know, everything seems to be kind of coming to a head, uh, as far as everybody, nobody seems to have the right idea. And of course, this is when uh, Choir kind of steps up and kind of gives his his pitch to the, his speech to the troops, which says, "Hey, we've got to band together." It's kind of like that scene in uh, the film Deep Blue Sea where uh, Samuel L. Jackson is, uh, you know, explaining how he's going, how everybody's going to survive, and then of course he gets eaten by the shark right before he gives his kind of grand speech. And it's not, not the same thing, but it's a similar kind of idea is that, you know, he gives his great speech, he's like, are you with me? And everybody, of course, just takes off <laughs> into their own, you know, everybody goes off in separate directions. And, you know, or even Quentin himself is thinking, um, you know, I probably should have just, tell you know, telepathically controlled all of them. But, you know, again, Sometimes the most inappropriate person to lead ends up being the leader, which I think is part of what Wolverine is doing himself, is that he's not, he doesn't think necessarily he's the right guy to run the school. And, you know, so I think he sees a lot of himself in Quentin Choir. So, but then we have, of course, this subplot enters the page, which is about Logan's brother. Again, 
I don't know that much about Wolverine beyond what's been recently going on in the X-Men world. I don't read his solo title. I don't know anything about really his past other than, yes, he has, you know, he, you know, I've read Origin, uh, which I think is an incredibly overrated story. Um, and, you know, so we have, you know, this reflection of his past and, but I don't know exactly where the brother comes from because it has been a long time since I have read Origin. So I don't know if this character really enters in. I believe that he did. Um, the only thing I really remember about Origin is the opening and I remember, uh, the, um, his affinity for redheads and kind of where that comes from. So that was it. But uh, Ramon Perez, who does the art here, does some really, really nice work. Does some really fun work as well. I mean, there's one moment where uh, Quentin Quire's got this uh, uh, kind of his psionic shotgun, and you know, even as he pulls the trigger, in little you know, right above it, it just says psionic, and then blam. And it's just, it's just, I thought that, I mean, it's just little details like that that made the art in this issue really fun and really kind of, you know, it, very much in line with what Aaron's been doing with this book, which has been kind of taking this concept of this school and having a good time with it for the most part. Obviously, it does get serious here and there, uh, but, you know, for the most part, it's just, it's fun. Um I don't care about the whole thing with his brother. Uh, that literally is something that doesn't interest me at all because Wolverine as a character never has been entirely compelling for me to know everything about the dude. Um, I, th I find his interaction with the team in a team setting much more interesting. So, uh, so that for me was just kind of like it deflated kind of all of the... Uh, the effort that had obviously gone into this issue. So, you know, these kind of bookends with Logan's brother. Uh, so, you know, just, it was, it, it was, I think it was really, really terrific issue until it made such an abrupt left turn that seemed to come out of nowhere and just didn't seem natural in the flow of this book. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I understand the bookends, but I, I just don't, I guess it's more of a care thing. I just don't care. So that for me was kind of like I had to drop uh, a little bit of a grade for that. But this is still a four out of five, still a fun book. It's v it's very well written. Aaron does, you know, again, a terrific job. I think the art by Ramon Perez is really good. So like I said, four out of five for, uh, for Wolverine and the X-Men number 25. Scarlet Spider, number 14. Uh, basically, we have, uh, you know, we have Araceli... Uh, on the run from uh, the brother-sister wolf pack uh, that seems to kind of know who she is. And we also have Kane in really serious trouble because basically he's dying um, up on this rooftop. Uh, and, you know, we have these moments of, you know, just kind of the... Uh, kind of almost the B story to this book, which is Araceli. Uh, she's much cleverer than uh, she seems to be given cre uh, credit for. She does have the ability to kind of almost induce fear into her uh, assailants, her would-be assailants, and she actually leads these uh, the you know this werewolf brother and sister team into uh, this like gang-controlled neighborhood in Houston. Um, in which they meet a whole bunch of, you know, really tough badasses, and they kind of want the werewolves' pelts <laughs> for themselves. Uh, but what's really important here is we have Cain kind of going through this, you know, as you die, you kind of see your life pass before your eyes thing. And so this kind of begins with... Uh, you know, Cain is in a church and he's being asked to confess his sins, you know, tell us about, you know, the woman that you killed, uh, and tell us about, uh, you know, the man that you betrayed, you know, he sees Ben, uh, Riley, and, you know, I don't know who the woman was, I don't know, like I said, I'm not 
terribly familiar with the uh, the character of Cain to know enough about his background to know who all these people are, of course, and then tell us about the father that you betrayed. And of course, we have the jackal. And, you know, so it seems, you know, he grabs this priest, is like, who are you? And basically, you know, this priest suddenly kind of dissolves and turns into this great, big, like, body that is created solely by spiders. Like, the spiders have made up his, you know, all of his features. And so we see him in this kind of, you know, almost dreamy world here, you know, and we have this idea of the Great Weaver. Now, I don't know if that's kind of like the JMS crap that was going on in his... Uh, in his run on this title, that seems like the kind of shit that he would come up with. But how the how the Great Weaver chose Peter to be kind of the wielder of the web uh, rather than Cain, uh, and just he wants Cain to embrace who he truly is, which is that of a killer. Cain is he's a killer. That was that is the purpose that he was born as, and that is all he will ever really be. And of course, you know, he consistently denies it. No, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a killer. I'm, that's not all that I am, more appropriately. And, but he also understands that, you know, this being, this thing, will give him another chance at life if he can only embrace what he was because he knows that Araceli is in trouble and he is relatively sure that she will not be safe until he is able to help her, until he's able to save her. And so he does eventually kind of, despite all his protestations, he does eventually accept this kind of gift from this otherworldly being. Um, and come and kind of arises again from out of this, you know, this kind of spider-like egg, if you will. Uh, well, let's just say a very different man. The thing that I found most interesting about this book and most significant, I mean, of course, the moments with Araceli, they are kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of pulse pounding and they're pretty thrilling. But what was really good about this book were the moments with Cain. Uh, even though I didn't understand all of them, I got the gist. And most importantly is there was there's a moment in which he talks about, you know, the fight that he's been, uh, you know, the, the constant fighting kind of within himself to deny himself the, the true nature and how freeing it is at last to kind of let that go, to stop fighting it and just be who he is. And this is the kind of stuff that I pretty much expect from Chris Yost on this title because he's been writing this book really well. Um, Koi Pham's art is it's very solid. Um, the really dark and kind of scary parts of kind of this, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, near-death experience, if you will, is really stark and really crazy and really frightening, uh, and it works really, really well. So the Araceli beats, they do work, but just not as quite as well as these moments. Because, let's face it, I mean, the book's moments are directed towards <laughs> Kane's character, so... And that's where it kind of needed to be, so... This book's a four out of five. It's very solidly written. It's very solidly done. Uh, it's just, you know, it lacks a little bit of the... I would have liked to have seen almost the entire issue be that kind of, this kind of nightmarish, you know, uh, you know, kind of otherworldly experience that uh, that Kane is, is undergoing. Uh, Ultimate X-Men 22. Uh, so basically we have... Uh, we have Tony Stark uh, giving some good and and, and interesting advice, uh, and uh, you know, sharing some secret plans with uh, some members of the uh, of the the good and not so good citizens of Utopia, particularly Jimmy and um, 
and Kitty, you know, basically, you know, the whole world is going to start coming out. You know, there's huge dips in, uh, you know, in world trade because of this, you know, this uh, this mutant seed uh, that can, you know, that can completely solve world hunger. Uh, of course, Stark Industries stock goes up, but <laughs> everybody else's in that field is dropping like a brick. Um, so we have, again, you know, Brian Wood, and also co-writing with him is Nathan Edmondson, another writer I'm not too big of a fan of, uh, or I'm not a big fan of. I do, I don't know. He's kind of very hit and miss. Uh, when he hits, it's kind of a soft hit. Uh, when he misses, it's like, bleh. Um, because he was doing Grifter for a while, and that, you know, that fucking book just sucked. Um, and I've read some of his indie stuff, and it's really not very impressive. Although, to be fair, I haven't read Prophet, um, so I don't know what that's all about. But, um, but I haven't read a lot of Ryan Wood stuff either, but this feels good. This feels right, uh, for the most part, at least his beginning. So this whole Reservation X thing is a little bit problematic, but anyway going on so you know it, we have kind of these again this kind of this unrest within these attacks from without that still seem to kind of further uh, you know and then of course we have the reemergence of page of husk uh, who's coming into utopia basically this is the only place left for her to go and you know a lot of people are not happy about this because hey you know she did set off a bomb that killed a whole bunch of people that are going to get the cure um, and, you know, split. And so, but even Kitty is willing to kind of forgive her her trespasses. So we have that moment. Uh, and, you know, the whole thing is, a you know, Kitty's whole ideal is that of mutant solidarity and mutant peace. That they can live on their own and do it without really that much interference from the outside world, but with, you know, and they can all also learn to protect themselves because when they stood united as Kitty kind of gives her kind of St. Crispin's Day speech moment uh, you know if they stand united they can see what they can do I mean they help liberate the Southwest from the Sentinels and from you know Stryker and you know everything that was going on there um, and then of course it's you know during the midst of this speech that the greenhouse explodes uh, and this is after already, you know, a, you know, fighter jet has, you know, flown over the area. Iron Man was able to intercept it as, you know, in the Iron Patriot armor uh, and stop it. And even, you know, Kitty showing mercy to this pilot who, you know, can only have the worst of intentions. Uh, again, is another good kind of PR move that Tony's kind of coaching her with. So we have the explosion of this, uh, of the, uh, the greenhouse seemingly destroying the the seed um, and of course that will take a lot of the heat off of utopia for a while but it also does further drive a wedge between those who are on Nomi's side and those who are on Kitty's and of course the you know kind of the big question here is Bobby you know, is Iceman going to go off with Husk? Because he seems to almost forgive her almost automatically because he's under the understanding that she's uh, me she, that she was mentally controlled when she did that, and maybe she was. We don't. I don't really know. That's not really made clear. Um, and, uh, and but of course, you know. And so, will he stay with Kitty or will he go with Paige? Uh, that's kind of left up in the air, but we have this final moment with, excuse me, with Kitty and uh, Tony, who's leaving, you know, basically saying everything's turning back to normal, but they've also, they're talking about their secret plan, which is the whole destroying of the, the seed, the greenhouse was a ruse. Uh, that Tony does indeed actually still have the seed, and he's planning to bring it back, and he's planning to do some more work with it, and eventually release it at a time that he feels is appropriate, and that 
mutants will have their place in history as being the ones who stopped world hunger. Um, so he splits, and you know that's pretty much it. So I mean, again, you know, we have Wood taking this divide to the next level by you know literally splitting the group the groups apart. Um, you know, again, despite all of Kitty's, you know, good for us kind of speeches. Um, and, uh, you know, Carlo Barberi's art continues to be less than stellar. Um, I don't know if Edinson is going to be continuing right around this, but at this point, I'm kind of hoping not, because this was not a great, you know, again, not a great issue. I mean, there seems to be an inherent problem with uh, Ultimate X-Men is that it kind of starts off with each writer, it starts off really good, and then just kind of starts to decline. Now, the decline here is not nearly as bad as it was with Nick Spencer, sadly, but, uh, but I am definitely noticing a drop-off in quality. There seem, each book is just kind of, you know, I think that because maybe Woods in maybe too familiar territory with this idea of Reservation X and everything like that, uh, that I think he maybe kind of felt a little bit sleepwalky through this. Um, again, Barbary's art doesn't help. So this was a three and a half out of five. I mean, it was a good story. I like what Wood is setting up for the next arc. But again, I'm just, it, it's hard to get all revved up about this. Um, so, on to DC. And we're going to begin with Katana, number one, which I just read, did not buy, um, because I'm a little bit wary of anything that Anna Senti writes, because I thought that her uh, Catwoman issue zero was absolutely abysmal, probably, probably the worst comic I read last year, with the exception of a couple of issues of uh, Avengers vs. X-Men. Probably the worst thing I read from DC last year. Anyway, um, so we have Tatsu, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tatsu Taro, she who wields the uh, 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 the soul uh, the soul taker, the katana, the soul taker, in which she believes that her uh, dead husband resides in or the spirit of her dead husband resides in the sword. Uh, she comes to San Francisco to Japantown uh, to find a woman who has a tattoo of the Soul Taker on her back and reveals this kind of crazed looking uh, you know warrior that kind of tells the tale of you know kind of this weird, you know, feudal Japan, you know, it's like, because this woman has tattoos all over her body, but you can only pay to see one part of the skin at a time, uh, because she's unclean and untouchable and what I, I, I um, and, uh, apparently this is important, but we don't know why, um, and then, you know, she's set upon soon by, uh, this group of uh, I don't know whether or not they're, they're ninjas or assassins, anyway. And they're led by Coil, uh, who is the, the wielder of the uh, the master of the silly putty, or, okay, it's called the spiral sword, but to me it's just this big silly putty sword that kind of just stretches, and it's metal, but it just, you know, it's all sorts, it just coils all over the place and everything like that. And what the hell is going on here? I mean, it's like this book it made no sense. I mean, it's just it, to me, it was just like, I don't understand what's going on at all here. Uh, the only kind of saving grace to this book, if there was one thing that would make me kind of at least read it again, would be only really to uh, look at it. Uh, because Alex Sanchez, who I'm, I'm not familiar with, uh, is doing art here, and the art is actually really quite good, uh, particularly in the battle sequences. And I do like Nascenti's writing in these in the kind of non-plot moments. 
uh, in which we have uh, Katana or Tatsu, you know, sort of uh, describing why, you know, she looks the way that she looks. You know, it's like, you know, her hairpins are actually, you know, kind of like steel shafts that she can use. Uh, you know, her earrings, you know, she can pull them off and throw them. Uh, they, you know, they're honed to a fine edge. Uh, she does wear, you know, kind of her mask on the top of her head so she can just pull it down when it's time for battle. Uh, even her, even uh, her uh, robes, when she twists, they kind of have like these little, like, you know, it's kind of, they're like, they have this like razor sharp slicing ability. Uh, so to show her efficiency in combat, uh, is actually quite interesting and quite thrilling. Uh, so that part of it I was really on board with. And the art, like I said, is really, really nicely done. There's some really lovely double-page spreads, particularly when she's kind of walking around this fountain. Uh, and there are, you know, it's kind of like the idealized version of what uh, Japantown considers to be old Japan to be. Now, Japantown is also... Uh, whether or not this is real or whether or not this is just something that they kind of made up for the book. Uh, it was a place where uh, Japanese internment happened during World War II and just a bunch of people that just haven't left it. It's kind of like almost uh, kind of almost like an open sewer with a, with the exception of this this kind of park with this you know very you know everything is kind of just serenity there. Um, and of course that is where she is attacked. Uh, so I don't know what the hell this book is even trying to be, what it's trying to say, what it's trying to do, but at least I did really, really enjoy the art, and I really enjoyed the you know the the, the action sequences. But the the rest of the story, you know, kind of with all of its uh, you know not mythology, but just you know kind of the understanding of. Uh, Japanese culture and everything like that. I mean, I don't consider myself to be totally ignorant of that, but there's just stuff here that I didn't, nothing, I didn't really glean on to anything that this book had to say or what it was trying to show. Uh, but like I said, so there were some sequences that were really nice, and that which is why this book was just kind of a shame. So this was two and a half out of five. I'm not going to pick it up again, except maybe to look through it and see if it's, uh, well, this is, you know, it's kind of pretty, uh, and, you know, there's some dynamic moments, but other than that, meh. Demon Knights, number 17. Uh, so we have uh, our reformed knights, for the most part. There's still a couple of members missing. Uh, but we have, you know, Exoristos, Horsewoman, uh, Sir Istin, um, they're all racing off to to save Jason Blood from Vandal Savage's various torments, um, and also we have Kane, uh, who is kind of you know marching further toward because you know of course each person has a stake in this game uh, and. It, it's not a game, really, but it has a stake in this mission, uh, specifically Exoristos, because uh, Cain, the intention is to march on Themyscira. Uh, and, you know, we have these moments between uh, Istin and Exoristos, kind of with Istin saying that, you know, even if you do help to save Themyscira, it's unlikely that they're going to allow you to kind of come back in. Uh, and so... You know, we have uh, these moments, and, you know, it's like everybody kind of plays their roles perfectly when once they get to Savage's castle. Uh, is that Exoristos comes in, uh, basically, you know, challenges uh, Savage to a uh, an arm wrestling match because, you know, he wants, you know, she wants him to prove his manhood against a woman. And, of course, that's, you know, a great challenge for for Savage, for someone like him, and of course, and then we have, uh, you know, Istin coming in to break Jason Blood out, but of course, you know, removes this, you know, kind of gag that's you know strapped around his face to reveal that you know 
Jason does not have a mouth anymore. We even have bits of Etrigan in hell uh, because and how pissed off he is at Jason Blood because he has not called him forth in all of these years. Um, but there's a reason for that. Um, so, I mean, the actual rescue of Jason Blood is actually pulled off perfectly, and we have some great moments from Horsewoman, uh, who just does some really wonderful stuff with her control of the horses and her rapport with the horses. It's just, it's so awesome, some of these moments. And they do even meet up with the last member, of course, Madame Xanadu. Um, so, but again, we have Kane you know, the ever-approaching, uh, you know, machinations of Cain and his ever-increasing brutality uh, and, you know, how he always seems to be not a threat, of course, until you get right up next to him, even to, like, the baddest asses out there. Uh, and then he just starts tearing people's arms off and just, you know, bleh. But Vendetti... Rob Vendetti, who's writing this book now, uh, he really seems to have a lot of these same notions of uh, fun and and fire that uh, that Cornell did, and maybe even better. Um, and and that's you know for me to say that about Paul Cornell is. I feel kind of bad almost because I love Paul Cornell's work on certain titles, particularly uh, Captain Britain and MI13, which I'm so I'm, I'm still kind of when I do reread it because I do have some of the trades and of course I have all the individual individual issues. I get kind of pissed because it's like this series was so fucking good and I'm so mad that they canceled it. Uh, but what can you do? You know, if it's not selling well, it's not selling well. But anyway. And Bernard Chang, despite the fact that Diogenes Neves is not doing this book anymore, Bernard Chang seems to have stepped to the plate, stepped to the plate, particularly in this issue, perfectly. I no longer miss Neves' work. I don't feel that uh, Chang is a subpar replacement for him. I feel that they are very much along the same lines now. And we have, you know, the color in this issue is done by... Uh, uh, Marcelo Maiolo, of course, you know, who's doing such an amazing job in coloring I Vampire. Um, it's just, I mean, there, there's a lot of really, as I was saying, just a lot of terrific humor, some awesome character moments. Um, and the only thing that I had a problem with with this issue, uh, sadly, is that it just... it. It was a little too brisk. As much as I enjoy a good, brisk, and entertaining read, this felt... I just wanted this to be a little bit longer because they were hitting on so many cool moments and having so many and so much fun with the characters and, and creating, you know... The, the threat of Kane is still a little bit out there, um, but I just... I guess part of me just wanted it to go on longer. So... This was ugh, just shy of a five. This is about like 4.75 out of five. This was a terrific book. I just wish that maybe there were some moments that could have been nipped and tucked a little bit to fit uh, a little bit more uh, story into. Uh, so now moving on to the really important parts of this week's reviews. And that is the Bat Family. So we're going to start by talking about Batgirl number 17. Now, as we famously know, Gail Simone for a time was fired from this book. And then the whole of the uh, DC internet followers uh, kind of blew up the internet 
saying, fuck you to DC, do not take Gail Simone away from Batgirl. And it was going to be Ray Fox that was going to be taking over this book. And in this issue is where we are treated to basically, uh, I would assume, the beginning of what Ray Fox wanted to do following the finale of Death in the Family. Now, those of you who have not read Batman 17 to the, I don't know, like two people out there that haven't read this book by now, might want to stop watching at this point in time because I'm going to spoil some stuff going forward. I'm not going to talk about Batman 17 until I get there, so we're working our way. Uh, so basically we have with this issue, uh, we have Barbara is kind of looking to get some payback on some of the thugs that Joker hired during the whole death of the family, you know, and everything that was happening to her. Uh, you know, so we have this post uh, death of the family, uh, you know, issue for Barbara, and that her biggest concentration right now is on finding these thugs of the Jokers. You know, using her eidetic memory, or eidetic memory, excuse me, to go through mug shots and remember the faces of the people that were involved, and so on and so forth. And she does start to put together some of the pieces. Um, of who a lot of these people are and starts to send this information to her father uh, just under the guise of a friend. Um, so, you know, of course, she's not intending to go out at all. She's intending to stay home, drink, you know, drink coffee and make sure that the cops can do their job, you know, unhindered. Um, but... Uh, we still have James Jr. to deal with. And James Jr. is... We first see him visiting the bedside of his mother, who he did go out of his way to save, but of course is still acting the big psycho. Um, you know, even has a line, you know, about, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, tell me how you're feeling, and if you can't talk, just use your fingers. You know, of course, you know, she's missing her ring finger on her left hand. Um, and we have, so we have kind of his evil machinations going on. Um, and basically he's got another twisted game for his sister to play uh, in which, you know, uh, they start to get reports of one of the, uh, one of the teams that went to uh, one of the teams of cops that went to pick up the uh, one of Joker's goons um, blows up. Is it a suicide? You know, was he wearing a suicide vest? What happened here? Um, you know, how could you know how could this have been pulled off? So she's you know gets all suited up and goes for a night out on the town, and uh, basically, um, you know, she's. You know, kind of looking into what the hell is going on. She, she, so she herself goes after the next group of thugs as they're all hiding out uh, in one of their hideouts. But of course, the cops end up finding them, and they think it's the cops that are actually coming in. But of course, it's Barbara as Batgirl <laughs> breaking down the door, beating everybody up. Uh, but sees no indication of any kind of you know. There's no plastic explosive. There's no vest. There's no nothing. So if these guys are suicide bombers, once they're getting taken away, where's the explosives? Um, and uh, of course, it's not that simple. Uh, they're not suicide bombers. They are being blown up from afar by a character that calls himself Firebug. Now, this is not to be confused with uh, Garfield Lyons, AKA Firefly, this is Firebug. It's another big costume loon with a bunch of like incendiary RPGs or something like that. I, whatever. Um, it's unclear as to whether or not this guy has been hired by James Jr. to uh, to 
you know, to blow all these guys up, uh, to play more games, but given the fact that he is kind of watching her every move, one would presume that he has something to do with it. Um, just with his penchant for playing games. And that's kind of where it ends, uh, as with uh, her, of course, confronting this firebug clown, um, who may not be such a clown. Anyway, this book is rife with problems. Uh, first of all, it is it is very, 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 very pleasing to me that Gail Simone is going to continue to do, be doing this book because Ray Fox just does not seem to have the same... It just doesn't have the same... Uh, just doesn't have the same voice as Simone does. I mean, just doesn't have the same kind of assured handle on these characters that Simone so obviously does. Um, and it is... And if Fox had continued to write this book, I could see this being a drop, because this book is just not good because you know no longer Ed Bennett is, is no longer on art here I think it's uh, Vincent Samperi uh, his art is decent but everything literally looks like it's a still panel there's no sense of real movement everything feels like a photo I guess there's no sense of dynamic movement here there's no sense of you know, there, there's no urgency to the visual storytelling that he, that Semperi uses. Or maybe it's Daniel. I, I don't know. Um, but by and large, it's just it seems like an amateur's take on a professional book. And you know, Fox, I can only assume is a, is a decent writer, but you know. The, the the whole book op you know it opens with kind of you know just before the confrontation with fire with firebug and it has this really kind of ludicrous um, you know this this very pretentious uh, internal monologue which we don't know who it's by yet until really the end of the book and we determine that it's actually its uh, thoughts going through James Jr.'s head. Uh, but it just, it was like, really? Because this is like, you know, this is like 10th grade, uh, like, poetry. It, it just seemed like it was really bad, hacky writing. So this, again, at best, was a 2 out of 5. I was very, very disappointed because this book really should have been more of an emotional journey for uh, for Barbara, especially considering everything that she's just gone through. And I think that if Simone had not been kind of, uh, you know, after issue 16, I don't know exactly what issue she's supposed to be coming back on for. So those of you who are out there who know, comment section, that's what it's there for. Uh, to correct me on my mistakes, <laughs> uh, but also to let me know what you're thinking. Um, but uh, to me, it just uh, this book just didn't do it for me at all. I just really felt like Simone would have taken this in a much different direction post death of the family. That would have been more personal. That would have been more involved. That wouldn't be quite so slapdash as this issue is. This was a very poor issue of Batgirl, so, of Batgirl number 17. But on to the books of the week. Um, now this is, again, if you take it as a whole, uh, some of the other books that I talked about last night are better than some of the books, uh, better, at least than one of the books that I'll be talking about here. Uh, but not much. The the ones that I scored as picks of the week, uh, at least one of them I think was was definitely better. I think Fatal would be 
Anyway, we have so Batman and Robin number seventeen. So basically, it is the direct aftermath of Death of the Family. We have a Batman and Robin, you know, Bruce and Damien returning home in the Batmobile. They're tired. They're exhausted. They just want to get some sleep. They just want to get some rest. Everybody wants to get some rest, you know, Alfred included. So, because they've all been through one hell of an ordeal. And it's basically a trio of dreams in this, uh, in this particular issue. And we start with, as they all go to sleep, we first encounter Damien's dream. And Damien's dream is, uh, is definitely more of a nightmare. Uh, it is him, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, him kind of facing his own duality as, you know, being, you know, of his dual heritage is that he is he's a Wayne but he is also an Al Ghul. He is you know, he was trained at by the League of Assassins. But, you know, he's a Wayne first, which, you know, you know, cuz we see, you know, it's like there he's in a submarine and he's meeting, you know, his other self, his Al Ghul self. Um and, you know, we see kind of like these drowned bodies of like, you know, Nightwing and Red Hood and the Joker and Alfred, who's like banging frantically on this, uh, on, you know, on the, the porthole of this uh, submarine. Uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, he wakes up and he sees there's a robin, the actual bird. <laughs> on the edge of his bed. It's an omen. Uh, and so he grabs the robin and he feels that the robin is trying to tell him something so he lets him free and of course he and Titus take off the hall, <laughs> take off down the hall of the manor after him and he hears the the bell ringing and uh, he's passing Alfred in the hall and says, you know, I you know, Alfred, I think that bell's ringing for you and Alfred's like, no, I think it's actually ringing for you. And what we see here is we see more of Damien's nightmare. Uh, that he is, um, that his father is indeed waiting for him. And that there is, you know, blood kind of strewn about the floor. And there's this giant bat that is kind of suckling on... <laughs> on Bruce, uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, hearkening back to uh, year one in the moment where Bruce is in the chair and he's bleeding out with the bell to uh, ring for Alfred. And then we go to Alfred's dream, which is, starts out as a nightmare, but ends up being a very nice dream. Uh, because he, uh, you know, is having this dream about uh, the uh, the elder Waynes uh, with Thomas and Martha, and you know he you know sees all of these bats uh, again you know, flying out of this this hole in the manor. And he goes down to see what's going on. All of the the bat family are there, pounding on each other, just beating each other to death. And there, of course, is the Joker, uh, watching it all, just letting it all go on. And you know, Alfred, of course, demands that you know he stops immediately. And of course, Joker doesn't. So what does Alfred do? Well. He grabs, you know, he brings up his double barreled shotgun. Bam. And Joker's head is just gone. <laughs> and so Alfred wakes up with a start. <gasps> but then he just kind of slowly drifts back to sleep, smiling. 
And then, of course, we come to Bruce's dream. And Bruce's dream, again, his parents. And, you know, he's building this little paper boat. And, you know, his parents are talking about, you know, I hope that you don't, you know, I hope that you're a strong swimmer, Bruce, because I hope that you don't think that you can just wash all of the darkness out of the city away with your little boat. Um, and, you know, even Bruce has this line, it's like, well, why not? It's my boat. Um, and he does end up following the boat because his parents are spilling down this waterway and he's trying to save them. Of course, when it comes out the other side, it's this ocean and the ocean is just filled with, you know, the horrors of Gotham, the, the evildoers, all of, you know, a lot of the members of his rogues gallery and he's just fighting them off, you know, saying, I don't need you. I don't need any of you. And then the whole boat is upturned by this giant, like, Joker whale. You know, it is, it's, it's, it's green. It has the long red mouth and everything like that. And you hear the laughter coming out of it. And that's when Bruce wakes up. Because Bruce is being pulled to safety by Damien. And so he goes to Damien's room, sees him there sleeping, and gives him one of those, you know, loving kind of, you know, that very fatherly, you know, kind of, you know, kind of running your hand through their hair as they sleep, as apparently fathers are wont to do. And then we go back to kind of the epilogue of Damien's dream, is that Damien and his father are going nuts across Gotham City, beating the hell out of criminals, just laying waste everything in their path as far as all the bad guys, all the crime, all the horror, all the despair of Gotham City, and they see the sunrise. And they're both just kind of standing there, and, you know, Batman says, you know, you know that this is a dream, right? And Damon says, I know, Father, but it's for once it's a dream. I don't feel like waking up from. And that's it. It's just such a beautifully told story of these three people and what they all mean to one another and how important each element of them are because you know part of Damien's dream even reflects the fear that he has for his father. That these are now people that genuinely do all care for one another. And it's not so much the, you know, I was learning, you know, I'm kind of learning how to be a father with Bruce, you know, with Damien trying to kind of learn how to be a son. I'm sure that when everybody wakes up, there's still going to be some, there's going to be some remnants, there's going to be some leftovers here to have to deal with. But for once, just even in these dreams, there is, at least for Damien and for Alfred, there is some comfort be found here. I mean, and of course, you know, these moments, you know, the, uh, you know, there, there are some just amazing moments that Tomasi and Patrick Gleason put together. There is, uh, of course, you know, the moment with the Joker whale, the moment with the kind of, you know, Alfred's kind of double barreled shampoo of, uh, of, of Joker, but the most beautiful moment in the whole book to me was this moment in which uh, uh, Damien and Bruce are kind of unsuiting themselves and uh, getting ready for bed, you know, just, and Damien takes his boot and takes Bruce's boot and kind of compares the sides. And that to me was just such a lovely, lovely beat that to me it was like, okay, I'm reading a five out of five comic already. This is going to, you know, this is going to be a great book. No matter what happens next, this is still going to be a great book. And it continued to be a great book because Tomasi and Gleason have those moments down. It's like, yeah, I get it. I understand that this is no matter what happens, this is a family. 
And they are a family of people that, despite what some people might think, or at least one of them might think, because this book really is kind of Damien's book more than anybody else's, but that he does really care for his father. And, you know, showed that obviously in the annual, uh, which uh, I don't think a lot of you read, but uh, I think a lot of you who are not picking up this book uh, amongst you guys, the guys who are watching this, the guys that I watch, uh, don't talk about this book anymore. And I'm starting to wonder why, guys, because this Batman and Robin is definitely one of the great reads out there, especially the last couple issues have been just awesome. So uh, start getting this book again, guys. You're not going to regret it. Trust me. So five out of five for Batman and Robin, number 17. Now on to the moment we have all been waiting for. My little, my new Batman, new 52 uh, armored figure, if you will. God, would it kill Mattel to make a, a cloth cape for a Batman figure one of these days? Or just any caped figure? It'd just be nice. Yeah, it'd be a nice change of pace. Anyway. Batman number 17. So amongst all of the various things that go on in this book, I mean, we have you know, these small details, this, this empty book uh, that supposedly had, you know, uh, Batman's plans for, you know, what to do with, with the family. Uh, the faces in the ice, the crowbar that Batman is wielding to beat Joker with. And how in Hanium, just one of those details that is so beautiful about what Snyder does with this book. Because this book is really about how everyone has faces. More than one. Even the Joker. Because we have all these ones. I'm not going to recount them all for you. I mean, because everybody's read this book. I mean, shit. Everybody's read this book. But what I really want to address here is almost all the reviews that I've seen amongst our YouTube comic community here are kind of down on this book. They're kind of down on this issue. Part of me understands it. You know, I was watching... Uh, you know, age of 42Q, just watching a bit of uh, what Sleepy Reader was talking about. Obviously, watch Ghost Critics Review. Um, although, admittedly, uh, Damien, the only bit of yours that I saw was uh, how you, you talk about how confused you were uh, with uh, parts of this book. See, to me... Like I said, I, I understand the frustration because this book was kind of the expectation. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the expectation that everybody had about this book, about this issue. Because up until now, the table seems to have been set for something that is going to blow your fucking brains out. Because you have this expectation that this is something that is really going to... Something's going to happen here that is going to upset the status quo pretty heavily. Somebody has got to die. Of course, you know, 
the the various polls that were taken online, all the guesswork and, you know, what's going to happen. You know, I mean, the biggest, you know, the kind of the winner of each poll as it came out, as far as, okay, well, this is the person that's going to die, is going to be Alfred. Mm -mm. Because obviously Alfred lives. You can't get rid of Alfred. And, and I, I did kind of... Uh, admire the way that uh, that Mark, a uh, ghost critic, um, really kind of summed this up here, that uh, you can't take any of these characters off the table. I mean, you know, Nightwing's got his own book, Batgirl's got, a, got her own book, uh, you know, Red Hood and the Outlaws can't kill Jason again. Uh, you know, Damien, of course, is Bruce's son, can't have that happen. Uh, so, who is going to die? Is it going to be Batman? Is it going to be Joker? Is it going to be Alfred? The the stakes that were set were so high that I think a lot of people felt very cheated that someone didn't die. I mean, of course, you can go. You can kind of come at it from more of a common sense angle. Whereas, yes, all of these people have their own books with the exception of Alfred and, and Joker. And so it would be, you know, you can't kill off a major character like this in kind of a, its own internal event. Now, maybe down the road, if the New 52 does decide to go all out with a big 52 wide crossover and, you know, put all, you know, mash all the big books together in some kind of huge melee, super status quo changing, uh, you know, event comic, then yeah, you might get somebody who's going to die there. But not in this book. I mean, it's not just, it's not just from a mathematical standpoint. I mean, it's also from a storytelling standpoint that this book, again, is about the death of of the family, not the death in the family. And we do see the consequences of Bruce's actions here. Because what this book, to me, how it did change the status quo for this book is ultimately with the relationship between Batman and the Joker. Because We've all talked about it. We all know about it. I mean, Frank Miller was kind of the first one to really uh, expound upon the idea of the fact that uh, the Joker is kind of omnisexual that, and that the focus of his rom all of his romantic feelings are towards Batman and that there exists a very symbiotic relationship that the both of them have, that both of them need each other that to kill one would be to kill the other and that the Joker will always return in one way or another even if it seems like he's dead. Now, of course, Frank Miller, you know, really, you know, attacked that rather brilliantly in The Dark Knight Returns. And here uh, we have, again, what I really believe to be something that is a game changer between Batman and the Joker most specifically because you really get the sense that Batman has changed. His feelings about Joker have changed. And yes, we know that he won't kill him. And yes, obviously this is well-broached territory within the comic itself. But, you know, again, you get the feeling that, well, Batman won't kill him because of his own sense of self-righteousness and that basically every person that the Joker kills, uh, you know, even these, uh, you know, even his own family, as it were, would be, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, is essentially Batman is responsible for that. I mean, so, I mean, we have the death traps, all of which are quite exquisite, all of which are quite well planned. The psych outs or fake outs, thank you, Mark, uh, are all extremely well done. 
uh, Capullo's art on this issue may be my favorite work of his yet, even though, I mean, the previous issue was pretty fucking stunning as well, but, you know, you know, although it's hard to really grade Capullo on a curve as far as his work in this, in this series is, is because he's been doing such amazing work from the get-go, and, you know, none more kind of supremely done perhaps than uh, Batman issue five with kind of the rotating, uh, you know, pages of, you know, the uh, Court of Owls story arc. But what we really have here is that Batman is just, he's done. He's done being Joker's proxy. He does not want to be his, he doesn't want to be his lover anymore. And that we do see change. We see his attitude change. Because Joker, while he has obviously done horrible shit to Batman in the past, there is something new here. There is an element to him that we haven't really seen approached in the pages of Batman, which is that of the, the love that the Joker has for Batman. The worship. I mean, almost as... You know, almost as a deity. Not just as a king, but almost as almost a kind of god in Joker's world. He needs Batman to exist, and Joker also needs, as we find, the anonymity of his personage. Is that he cannot... He cannot abide the idea of learning, perhaps, who he truly was. And, of course, the question not so much remains, you know, because we don't really see, uh, you know, we, we don't really know for certain that Batman knows who the Joker was before he became the Joker, because his identity as the Joker is all that he has. And to strip that away from him is a fate worse than death. Um, so that is what I saw out of this book. The consequences that came out of this book, of course, will continue to stretch through the Bat Family books, I think, for a while. Because there was a betrayal. And, you know, even when we do see Bruce visiting Joker in Arkham after they took in Dick, uh, and he goes up to Joker's cell in Arkham with the card, you know, that there was, there was a knowledge there. And that the, uh, keeping that secret may have, you know, has caused all of his family to go through great pain. So, this is something that I think Batman is going to, that Bruce is going to have to come to terms with. Is that, because, you know, secrets are kind of his, almost, I mean, he's not a spy, but secrets are kind of his stock and trade. I mean, you know, if you go back to, you know, the brilliantly done Tower of Babel storyline from Mark Wade in JLA, I mean, that is, you know, secrets are Batman's currency. Knowing as much as he can about his enemies and about his allies is what he knows because Batman is all about contingencies. So, while a lot of you were disappointed, and like I said, part of me understands your disappointment, I think that you need to give this book a longer look, another try, give it some more examination, because I think that you'll see that there definitely is a shift here in the status quo. Even if somebody didn't die, it doesn't matter. Because when it comes down to it, Snyder has written a amazing tale.
he has created something that we've been wanting for many years, I think. And it is hard to think of a better within the confines of Batman actual. I mean, not, you know, not talking about the killing joke, not talking about Dark Knight Returns, you know, nor any of kind of the one shots, you know, man who laughs, so on and so forth. But within the confines of Batman, it's hard to think, at least certainly off the top of my head, of a better story for the Joker than Death of the Family. Snyder and Capullo really have crafted something great. Even, like, the only thing... I think if someone had died, it would have let me down. Because it would just have been more for shock. More for saying, you know, look what I can do. And Snyder's not that guy. He's not that writer. He doesn't do that kind of storytelling. Thank God. Because he knows which roads to take. He, he can shock us. Yes, he can. <laughs> yeah, he can. But he doesn't go for anything cheap. And I know that's not what a lot of you were expecting. You weren't expecting him to go cheap, but you were expecting something different from what you got. And I think that maybe a lot of your distaste for... I mean, I don't, nobody, I think, is disputing that this is a really good book. But I think that the dispute is that it felt somewhat familiar, uh, that it felt um, like there was a payoff that was supposed to come that never came. But I think if you go through it again, maybe think about it a little bit longer, I think it did. And I think this book is better for it, for not going kind of down the road that we were expecting it to. So by that I have to say, yeah, this is a five out of five book for Batman number 17. That's it for this week, boys and girls. Uh, I know that a lot of you are probably gonna have a lot to say about Batman 17 that you may or may not have already said in your own reviews. Please feel free to use the comment section. Of course, like it dislike it. If this is your first time here, please feel free to, dis to subscribe. And, you know, this, you know, if this is your first time here, yeah, they're always this long. Okay? So, uh, I, again, thank you for watching. Thanks for sticking with me. I know it's an hour 37 minutes. Uh, so this whole week, if you put the two together, yes, we've got a longer than three hour <laughs> tour <laughs> of the Shadow Gallery and of new comics, bitches! <laughs> so thank you again for watching uh, so much, you know, guys, you know, who sit through this whole thing, you mean the world to me. Uh even guys who skip a bit and then come back still makes me happy as long as you're paying some attention <laughs> to what I have to say even if you're just focusing on the books that only you read or that you that you know whatever point is thank you thank you again for staying with me for so long thank you for watching so I will say this has been the Shadow Gallery. Good night. Thank you. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And I will always be reminding you to stay in the shadows. <laughs>